Welcome to another How to Write Science Fiction, and today I'm joined by yet another special guest, Dave Cook. If you say hello, Dave. Hi there, how you doing? So, you've written in a number of different genres, but I suppose uh, when it comes to science fiction, your sort of biggest claim to fame right now is your Killtopia comic book series, uh, which I've been uh, getting into recently, and has recently been picked up for a TV show, an animated TV show, I understand. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, it's uh, it's one of these things that happened a long time ago. Um, I, my, I have a newfound appreciation for how these adaptations work. Um, it was like, I don't know, three years ago, we were approached by a LA studio that was a startup. They hadn't really begun uh, producing anything yet. Um, and they were like, hey, we're looking for our first projects and, and Kiltopia looks like something we'd like to adapt. Um and their big thing is is basically like transmedia and they were like hey you know we see Kiltopia as being more than a tv show there's potential for merchandise and video games um so it's crazy actually they approached us and just said hey we really like the look of this and we'd like this to be our first production um and it took many many years of lawyers and negotiations and i'm just thankful we have a publisher that helped us navigate all of that because uh, well yeah now it's happening which is crazy <laughs> <laughs> Are you going to be doing any writing on that yourself, or is that all hush hush right now? Or uh, sad, sadly, not. Um, it's gonna. It, that's the weird thing. It's like having someone else adapt your work into a different format. It's. I'm completely fine with it. You know, I'm not precious about it, but it is weird, and I'm really intrigued to see how someone else adapts my comic uh, and my world and my characters. So yeah, I'm really excited about that. So the, the writer we have is uh, Philip Gillette, who. Um, wrote the first two seasons of Love, Death and, Death and Robots. Oh, nice um, one. Clar- yeah, yeah. I'll clarify that, though. He wrote most of the episodes in season two and a big chunk of the ones in season one. Uh, so he didn't do all of them, but he was like, I, I guess you would call him the main writer. Um, he also did a film called Europa Report, which... Um, so, yeah, if you're talking about, you know, someone, the best person to adapt a cyberpunk comic into a short TV format, it's going to be the guy that wrote... Uh, <laughs> Love different robots. <laughs> so yeah, I'm really, really happy with that. So how did you get started with uh, writing as a, as a career of sorts? Yeah, I mean, so going way back to the beginning, uh, my first like big, I suppose, big job in writing was as a video game journalist. Um, we're going way back to like 2006 here. Um, I uh, started out doing a small column in the, the Scotsman newspaper, uh, national newspaper here in Scotland, of course. Um, and... Then eventually, uh, you know, got a full-time job as a game writer for a few publications and websites, which is great. Um, then I thought, hey, I want to write something that isn't like articles. You know, I want to write some fiction or um, whatever form that may be. So I, I actually started writing a, a novel, a science fiction uh, novel, uh, which no one will ever see because it was terrible. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I finished it, which is m- miraculous. I finished it then, on- I then and only then decided I didn't want to publish it. <laughs> um, as a complete whole, I-, I-, I sort of like had to be honest with myself, you know, like the, um, it was the descriptive writing that-, that was just really bad. Like, oh, the the guy walked into a room and it looked like, you know, like this and that. And it was just awful. Like I couldn't really transfer what I saw in my head to the page that's when I thought, hey, I'm going to get someone to draw it, right? And then I thought, comics, right, cool. Comics is probably the way to go. So I started off, you know, with uh, doing a little one-shot um, in an anthology called Overload, which I, you can't get anymore. It's quite an old one. Um, but <laughs> my first ever commission was um, a, a four-page uh, story about a killer teddy bear that uh, kills its owner because it's st- they st- they've grown up and they've stopped playing with it. So it was a spin on Toy Story. <laughs> so that that happened it didn't get much reach um it was a small project but then i started pitching uh elsewhere like anthology so future quake um picked up a, a short by me um called final boss which is a video, very cliche but it's a video game character who comes into the real world and kills the player all right <laughs> for making them so the, the, the video game character's backstory is really tragic like max Payne or something you know their their families their family dies in the first cutscene. And every time the player restarts the game, um, they have to the, the character has to relive that their family's death, and they blame the player for that. Um, so they kill the player. Um, That's really interesting. Yeah, and then yeah, uh, yeah it was it was a weird one. Um, so that that was published in Future Quake, um, 
then I thought I'm going to do my own big story, which ended up being Bust, which is a post-apocalyptic story. Um, all my stuff is inspired by video games, predominantly, so this is my take on, I guess, Fallout, with a little bit of Mad Max and Fight Club th- thrown in there too. And I thought, okay, I'm going to do this, and I, I worked with my friend uh, Chris O'Toole, who I just met through uh, the the forums of the website, the gaming website I was writing for at the time. I just went in there and said, hey, are there any artists in here that that want to do some comic work? And he was like, yeah, sure, I like your writing, so yeah, I'll, I'll help you out. We did it as a one-shot, black and white. We kickstarted it as well. We made just over a grand, which was great. I mean, that was our first ever Kickstarter. I had no fan base, so we were over the moon. And then um, I went to a comic con. I basically shared a table with a friend of mine, Janine. Um, she let me share a table with her at Glasgow Comic Con. Um, I sold out. I just had a small print run, so selling out doesn't sound that impressive um, when you put it that way. But it was like, you know, it was enough, you know, to cover the cost and... Then uh, people, my friends started getting in touch, saying, hey, "Hey, I really liked your your comic. It was really cool. Are you, are you when when are you going to do a second issue?" And I was like, "Oh yeah, I could I could keep going, couldn't I? I could do like a second issue and then a third, and then do more more different stories and different series." And it just sort of all happened from there. Um, not not the most common trajectory, I guess, for getting into this, but um, I guess we all have our paths through it, right? Um, that's just where I sort of came into it you know a lot of happenstance and failed attempts and just learning from it and and soldiering on really um yeah here we are (laughs) these days what is your your typical writing routine if you have a kind of set routine for when you're approaching new scripts and things the the biggest thing to do really is just like before you even write anything just spend a lot of time thinking about it maybe make some notes on paper right um using killtopia as an example um that whole that whole series came out of basically initially the desire to do something based on my favorite Japanese action video games, so like No More Heroes, uh, Bayonetta, Vanquish, Resident Evil Four, all games that have quite a punky kind of brash vibe of like larger than life characters. Um, tonally, they're all kind of similar. They're all kind of yeah, they've got a swagger to them, you know, and just so ludicrous and over the top. So I was like, okay, I want to tell something. It's a bit brash. It's a bit kind of garish, a bit mad. But then I thought I need to, I need like to make it interesting to the reader. I need to have something that's relatable. So there you've got this faraway cyberpunk world that doesn't feel like our own reality. What is something that can really speak to people? And at the time there was all this talk. I mean, this is like two thousand and I don't know fifteen, round about then. Um, at the time there was all this talk about having the national health service sold off to America and what that would mean for people like. You know, if I broke my arm arm tomorrow, could I afford it without insurance? No, I couldn't. I couldn't. I couldn't get the help I needed. So I thought, okay, I'm gonna do a healthcare healthcare story, something about inequality. And you can start to see, like, from that, I've got my broad themes. Um, one of the major plot points in Kiltopia is a disease that um, is incurable. Um, only the richest people in the future can afford, uh, not the cure, but just the 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 treatment to ease the pain. There is no cure for it. Um, but if you're too poor to do that, you can join the blood sport of Kiltopia. Literally risk your life to earn enough money to buy the cure. So it's almost like what lengths do people go to uh, to get the health care they need? Um, the main thing I do practically is I come up with a lore bible. So what's the setting? What is it like? What's the climate of this place, both politically, social, pop culture? Um, what are the people like in this world? What's the vibe? Um, what's the level of technology? Like, is it proper sci-fi fantasy or is it like more grounded? Because I'm a big believer that the setting of your comic should be a character in in its own right. Um, then I start thinking about the characters. Um, you know, I do biographies for the characters, you know, who they are as people, what's their hang-ups, what's their demeanor. Um, and if you get that right, it means that you lessen the risk of breaking character by accident. So I've got, the, yeah, to recap, I've got the lore Bible, character biographies then i start to work out my main plot beats so it's like beginning middle and end obviously the main ones um so i work those out um i always have the ending to my comic series in place um before i even start writing it because everything that has to happen in that comic needs to be in service of getting to getting the reader to that end point or else you risk you know comics getting padded out too much maybe dragging a bit um you don't want that so you want to just make sure everything that happens is in service of that that ending so that's like I'd, I'd say a lot of that is quite standard process for comics but 
where, where it starts to fall apart for me is that I procrastinate too much. I I'm really bad for killing a lot of my ideas like prematurely, perhaps. Like if something doesn't feel right, I I maybe get a bit stressed, a bit anxious about it. I mean, I have like anxiety anyway, you know. So um, when something starts to not feel right, or if I can't connect two plot threads, I panic and enter a bit of a doom spiral where I'm like, oh, the whole series is crap. <laughs> I'm gonna. I know. Yeah, you know. I know exactly how how that feels. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Oh man, like oh, you're you're not good enough to be a writer. All this kind of psychological crap, but. Um, so I'm bad for scrapping stuff and starting over over with a blank page. You, you know, I have the ideas in my head, so it's not like I'm starting totally from scratch, but sometimes I've scrapped an entire issue if it's just not working. It's always worked out in the end, but it's probably why I couldn't get a job at like Marvel or DC on a monthly comic, because I, I work quite slow, you know. Um, slow, methodical, I obsess over everything, but I, I, I guess maybe that, that's worked in our favor because we get good reviews and people like our stuff. And so I'd say like pre-plan a lot of stuff before you start writing like the lore Bible and stuff, but maybe don't do the whole anxiety and scrapping things that I do <laughs> when I come to write it. <laughs> Try and avoid that if you can. So does that mean like before you write the full manuscript, you've planned out the whole plot in advance? Or are, or do you like find it as you go along, or do you do you kind of like set up the lore and the characters and things, and then find it, or do you have to plan everything out in detail, like the whole plot, before you start writing the manuscript? Oh, like d- d- I definitely don't plan out the whole thing. Um, I I I I've thought about doing that, but I I like to kind of write in the moment, you know. So, um, a lot of the stuff in Kiltopia, e- even though it's a cyberpunk kind of story, like like I mentioned, you know, the whole N- NHS thing, um. The health service thing. Um, I like to work in things that are relevant at the time. So the the next issue, so issue four, um, has a lot of stuff about protest and like um, it, that was that was entirely inspired by um, the George Floyd Black Lives Matter protests and how you know how people really came together, you know when when they were spurred into action and to fight against injustice and that kind of thing. So th- there's a bit of that in there. Um, um, obviously based around different themes I mean um, I, I, you don't want to make it too close to home uh, you want to just it's, it's more broad stroke so there's a lot of protest type, type stuff in there a lot of inequality so so you asked like you know do I have the whole thing in advance I, no I, so what I do is I have the beginning middle and end of each issue kind of mapped out um, in my head you know because um, the lore it's all in the, in the lore bible you know the sort of overall sort of direction of where I want the plot to go the bits in between, those are the bits that I tackle at the time, um, because I, I want to make them current and and not not even just current from a political sense, just like inspired by things that I've seen recently or played recently. I, you know, playing video games for me just spins out a lot of new ideas in my head, so I want to try and capture some of those. So, by all means, you could write a whole series in one go, you know, and have it already, but. Knowing me, I'd see something that would make me want to go back and change it. So that's why I just write issue to issue. So yeah, that that's my kind of method. It's not it's not for everyone, but I think yeah, um, that that's how I like to do it. When you're writing, how much are you thinking about the audience or the reader? Uh, because I I've spoken about this a few times where in like f- big fandoms and things in particular, but it kind of applies to independent stuff, which is like. Um, I, I'm of the belief that you should never write anything quote-unquote for the fans because you can never really meet the needs of like, you know, all those different people who have all different opinions. And, you know, Nicholas Meyer, the guy who wrote and directed um, Star Trek to the Wrath of Khan, uh, said that you should only ever write for yourself and only try to meet like your own standards because you're the only person you know you can truly satisfy and I think that's I I find a lot of truth in that kind of statement. But do you think of the audience or the reader a lot when you're writing, or do you not think about them at all? It, I suppose I suppose maybe because I'm like I've written all five parts of Kiltopia now, um, and th- it was all written for me, right? I mean, like y- that's 100 percent correct. Like your opinion is it's not the only one that matters, but it's yeah, it's the only only you will know if you're going to be happy with your own story, right? You have. It's almost like when you send books out for review, um, it's totally in the hands of the gods once you do that. The reviewer will either love it, hate it, or be indifferent about it, right? You have no no control at that point. 
so I know giving up that element of control is hard. Like maybe if you wrote something that was safe, I guess is maybe what we're kind of driving at. You know that you think, okay, fans of this thing will probably like this. Like, are you being true to yourself? You know, like, are you going to get the same satisfaction? I can tell you one thing: you're not going to get though in that book is your own creative voice is not going to shine through as much in that book because you, again, you're not being true to yourself, right? Um, you're not going to establish your own kind of style because effectively you're you're warping it by by yeah, just just trying to tap into something else that's not really you. How important is a character's name? Uh, in your mind because I know some people really go over names again and again where they're like oh it's not right yet and it needs to be this kind of person and I suppose with like with something like Keltopia um, as you say like a lot of the character names are kind of um, specific or over the top and, and quite stylized so how, how much how much time do you dedicate to getting a character's name right so that that can definitely change um, I'm lucky I'm kind of lucky with Keltopia and that most of the names are <clears throat> have been chosen as Kind of yeah, either Easter eggs or kind of inspired by actual people or or game characters. For example, in Killtopia, we have a character called Blaze, who is straight up an influenced by influenced by Blaze from Street uh, Streets of Rage. Um, and then there's Travis, who came from No More Heroes. Um, he's the main character in, in No More Heroes. Um, I'll be honest, I'm I'm quite bad at coming up with original names. I I actually think that's one of my one thing I I you know being honest. Um, that I need to work on, because um, I've written I've written vid- a video game as well, and um, we had to come up with a whole cast of like NPC names and character names, and I I really struggled with it, because um, it was a dark fantasy game, and it's hard to hard for me to come up with stuff that doesn't sound like a Lord of the Rings character yeah. that's already been Fi- already been yeah. named. You know, fictional names um, are so hard when it's not like yeah. Brian or anything, and it has to be like a made up name that's like brand new it's so hard like to come up with something which either doesn't sound daft or doesn't sound like something that's already done before yeah oh yeah uh, totally and um i i do think about it quite a lot um certainly stiletto was um again i keep going back to her but she's she's my my sort of go-to character um that isn't a reference to anything um i had i had like a persona in mind i had like her, her original, I suppose if you if you want to go back to the cliche thing, my original idea for her was more like a Catwoman kind of character. Strong enough to hold her own, quite unhinged. Um, although the, the stiletto we ended up with ended up being more sort of grounded. But the initial one was she was totally, again, this leans into the crazy personas that my favourite Japanese games have. Just so over the top, like reckless, just, just a, a, a nutcase. <laughs> um, but she's also like kind of flawed as well. Um so I thought I wanted something that's kind of strong like that and, and has like kind of, a, it's kind of a one word kind of, I don't know, quite a powerful sounding name. Then I, But then I started to think about what weapons she has and I thought she's going to have a stiletto sword. And I thought, ah, stiletto, there we go. So that's how I came up with it. I was thinking, okay, what kind of technology does she have? What kind of weapons? Her sword is like a stiletto sword that uncoils into a whip. So that kind of goes back to the Catwoman thing. Also a little bit of Ivy from Soul Calibur. Uh, she's a character that has like a sword that com- expands into a whip. Um, but yeah, uh, names are super important. Um, I- I'd say try not to d- dwell too much on it. And if, if you're not really coming up with something uh, after a while, either stop thinking about it completely and something good will just pop into your head eventually. I guarantee that will happen. It might take a while. Or, and this is going to sound really dumb, just use a random name generator. There's loads of them online. I don't. I, I, I'm not suggesting use the things that it tells you, but it's really good for inspiration. Yeah, I yeah, absolutely. I absolutely agree with that. I don't know anyone. Else. I was like thinking I was alone in doing that. It's a really good starting point. Random name generators. It just kind of if it, if you just kind of like generate some random syllables for yourself, then it really can help prompt your brain into like connecting some dots, and then it's like ah, I've got a name for something now. So yeah, random name yeah. generators can be really helpful. Totally, totally. There's no shame in using it. I'd say maybe don't don't lift the exact name it gives you, but like you can you can crib it, you know, crib from it and just you know remix something it gives you back, you know. Um, yeah, but yeah, names are important, but um, yeah, don't don't get too upset if it doesn't come straight away. Yeah, I I, I remember um, I try to do a thing where if I'm coming up with like a, I think it's more important for a protagonist, either a protagonist or a villain. Where um, this is like a weird thing, which is like I try to come up with a name where I'm like, could this name be on a book series? 
You know, and you know how like protagonists in books always have kind of really distinct, memorable names, where it's like a someone and someone and the thingamajig, you know, like Percy Jackson and the yeah. something something, or like you know Harry Potter and the thingy thing. And I feel like you know just having that that kind of like few syllable names like Alexander Washington or like Elizabeth Diamond or something like that, you know, names like that, <laughs> you know, where it's just like you know you got a couple of syllables and they're distinct enough that they they can kind of get stuck in in people's heads. You know, and things like that. And so that's kind of an approach that I try to take um, with, uh, because the novel that I've written, the main character in that's called Tobias Eli. And I thought that's one of those names where it's just like, it just flows nicely that you could kind of name a book series after that. I like that. But um, I like that. Yeah. Other times I try to be very wanky with it, where I try to look up names which mean specific things. Uh, So it's like if I've got a soldier character, I'm like, what's a name that means warrior or something like that? But. That always never works out because because you look up the name and then it's like a really unimpressive sounding name and you're like oh okay and then you just got to come up with something else. <laughs> but uh, again, I feel like I will say I I will say though I've done that as well, right? So for my series vessels, there's a lot of cog- cognitive stuff in it. So there's a lot of going into dreams, um, m- m- the reality warping, all that kind of stuff. So I looked up um, uh, medical terminologies to do with the brain. Um, so quite a lot of the names in that are actually derived from things like um, the Oblongada stuff like that. So we have a character called Gadala, which came from from that um, heavily remixed, but at least that was my starting point. So um, a lot of that that's one example. In fact, it's the only example in a comic where I've, I've looked at something else to find the meaning of it, or or something that already exists and then then remix it like that. Um, one thing I forgot to mention, it's probably one of the more important things about names, is if you're doing a comic, draw the character before you name them. Because once you can see them, right, you can sort of think, okay, this looks like a insert name here. Um, you know, um, I, think, I think like having a bi- biography is great, but I think if you can actually, even a rough sketch, just can help you visualize, like, look, what name should this person have? You know, what would you call them? And it will become probably a lot clearer once you can see them. That's how we came up with the name of the, the protagonist uh, for BPM. Her name is Maya, Maya Wickburn, um, um, which isn't like too wanky. It's not too like action hero protagonist, you know, like, I don't know. Um, but it just, it just, I just looked at, looked at the picture of her and thought she looks like a Maya. Um, and Wickburn, I think maybe Burn was in the back of my head because, um, I grew up in a street called Roseburn Street. Um, I don't know. I, that that just sort of sprung to me in, in mind. And I thought, okay, cool. Um, also, her surname, Wick, so she's a cop and her police chief is like kind of the grizzled, again, going back to stereotypes, but we, we play it for laughs. The grizzled police chief who always wants results, damn it. And I thought, what's a good surname that the ch- the chief can shout? You know, Wickburn! <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, okay, that's, that's perfect. Um Pound, pound, pounding his desk and shouting, you know, Wickburn. Um, I think I, th- I think that raises like a, an interesting point about visual inspiration because um, one of the one of my favorite books that I that I own is a uh, Chris Foss the Dragon's Dream, and it's just artwork with like there's a couple of captions about, but it's a uh, Chris Foss is a very famous conceptual artist that worked on like Alien and Yadorowski's Dune and the first Superman movie and I love his art style and like one of my favorite books is just it's just a collection of artwork and uh, all this stuff is done he's done and um he, sometimes the caption is just like he paints this city and called like Atlantis or he paints like two spacemen running away from something and then the caption is like the thing in shaft 28 or something like that and like some of it's like actual titles of books that he did artwork for some of it's just like the name of the piece and i think that's a really cool starting place it's kind of like a visual writing prompt in a way uh to to do that where you have a a visual a piece of artwork that you can kind of springboard off from and say well what's the story behind this picture and like something i do on instagram all the time is i just follow loads of like sci-fi concept art accounts and if i see something where i'm like oh that looks like it could kind of belong in the universe for this idea that i've got and then i just save it to collections of all the different ideas and that's a, those are really good things for kind of coming up with names or coming up with plot beats or imagining characters and things like that is uh, just having that visual inspiration there can be very very helpful yeah i like that it's, it's like having a mood board right like for a, a a film or something right or a video game um just those kind of images that can inspire your the tone and stuff i mean we 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 did that 
I, we did that kind of with um, Killtopia. We, you know, grabbed images of things like Akira and, and Blade Runner and, and things like that. But I think, I think very quickly, like it did definitely help, you know, get get our tone. But it, in a way that we looked at all that stuff and thought, we don't want to do this. We want to do our own thing. <laughs> um, I, th- I think we realized, like, let's not copy that stuff. So that's maybe a bad example. But absolutely, yes, mood, mood boards can definitely get you to a place where you think, okay, this is a, this art is kind of speaking to you, right? You start to think, what is this place that I'm looking at? What, what are the people like in it? What's the, what kind of things can go on here? So yeah, the whole mood board thing is a great, great uh, tool, uh, definitely, if you're trying to get the, the sense of place down or the, the tone of something. Yeah, I really like it. This is an interesting question because um, uh, in like the sort of list of questions that I've got, there's a what differentiates good dialogue from bad dialogue. But I was wondering if that was like you have to kind of approach that differently with comic books because, of course, with comic books, you know, sort of larger speech bubbles are kind of expected sometimes or sort of thought bubbles and things you can use in comic books, which with my experience with films and things is you don't get as much opportunity to do that. So how do how is writing for dialogue for comic books? Is that different somehow, or you know how do you kind of go about doing it, that? Yeah, do you, do you know I, th- I, th- I think it will be because because you have the added danger of making the text box so large that it starts to go over the artwork. Um, also as well, I mean because because comics aren't in motion, right? There's this whole thing about um, I'm going to use a term that term that I always apply to action films because I'm I'm a big action movie nut. Um, I, I love the craft that goes into them, you know, teeing up a set piece, the, the choreography. Um, there's, there's a term that comes with that called scene geography. Um, so it's establishing the kind of play space of an action scene, right? So how many times, for example, have you watched a movie where two people are shooting each other, but you can't quite tell where they are or who's shooting at who? And it's like, yeah, like things like crossing the 180 line stuff like that it's it's like you get confused really fast same with things like shaky cam right so where what i'm kind of driving at with that is like your panels need to have enough space to be able to help people get their bearings like okay what's happening in this scene what am i looking at and don't forget you know the the, the back, backgrounds in a comic the artwork tells a story as well that's the beauty of comics you know you can really look at a, a panel in a comic and really derive a lot from it like what's what's the atmosphere in this scene what's happening um but if you've got a big panel of text over that you're obscuring it so one you're going to annoy your artist um and two um yeah you're just going to hide you're going to cramp the panel um one i mean before you even get to the dialogue i mean the one thing you need to to think about with comics is how many panels do I have per page? Um, I have a hard limit at six maximum. That that for me is optimal. Um, um, I think at most I try to make every page five or less panels um, just because it lets the, the artwork breathe. And if you do need to have a bigger speech bubble, um, you can do so without it being too detrimental to the art at five panels. It's, it's kind of a good sweet spot. Um, of course you've got things like Watchmen where there's like 13 panels on a page which is crazy to me but it actually works in that book so it's not a hard rule but like I'd say six panels is probably what you want to aim for as an upper limit but yeah with the dialogue you know it goes back to the whole you know plot arc and planning out the trajectory of the story it's like people when people are talking in your comic it needs to be in service of the plot um, you can have little asides and stuff, right? You know, little fun diversions from the core plot. That That's fine. And that actually builds character, you know? People have little ticks or they have little things that they talk about or someone has someone tells an anecdote that doesn't have anything to do, to do with the main plot. Fine, you know, put those in, but always be thinking like, look, is this scene actually contributing to the plot? Um, also, but on the flip side, you don't want to be contributing to the plot so much that it becomes exposition. Because nobody likes exposition. No, you know. And again, in comics, it's like, is your character explaining something that would be better if you just showed it through the artwork, right? Um, don't just have a scene where people are talking to you, uh, explaining things at you, when you can actually have a scene that shows it happening. Um, for me, though, like th- the main thing for me is before I even write dialogue, I say it out loud. I have like the scene in my head. It's it's almost like improv comedy, right? 
they know what the scene is. The actors tend to know what the scene is, where it's headed, what the main point of the scene is. Then they'll just riff on stuff. So for me, I'm like, okay, this is the scene where this thing needs to be established or the characters need to do this. And I'll just like, as the characters, sometimes out loud, which is really embarrassing, I'm, I'm, you know, uh, or just in my head, I'll actually just say the dialogue to make sure, does it sound, does it sound natural? Is it waffling too much? Is it, is it meandering? Because um, you probably noticed that I ramble a lot and go on tangents. Um, that's just, yeah, totally. Th- th- that's just who I am though. But, um, but but you don't want to do that in the dialogue, right? Especially when you've only got... When you think of this as well, standard comic page size is 22 pages. You can go bigger if you want. You can go smaller if you want. But that's your space. Make sure you don't want to waste any of it. You know, um, you want to make every page and every panel count. So is is what... what, what is, is the dialogue that I'm saying, is it actually in service of the plot or is it meandering? Um... Then, but sometimes I'll just write down like basic dialogue that doesn't have character in it. You know, um, I'll maybe write the dialogue for a scene first, then I'll go back and add the character to it. So the little, you know, so there's certain characters in the Kiltopia that have certain ticks, you know, they'll say certain words. Or so one of the characters, again, Blaze, um, is obsessed with uh, 90s pop culture. So she'll use like 90s slang, like gnarly, bodacious, awesome. Um, so, but I, I add that in later. I'll see like what the base the base dialogue looks like. Then I'll start to add the personality to it. Um, then you know it's a case of adding the panel descriptions to that. You know to help the artist know what's happening in the scene, and then it just it just builds up from there. But yeah, you you want dialogue that sounds natural and it it stays away from exposition, and just it, it's clear to read. You know. Um, you don't want to have to read a panel and have to reread it because you didn't quite get it. Yeah, exactly. Um, I suppose this this will, uh, will be like the second last question, I guess. Um, do you actually enjoy writing? <laughs> because uh, you, you said earlier that you know when you're procrastinating and stuff, it can feel quite horrible. But um, do you actually enjoy the process of writing? Because I remember um, Paul Abbott, uh, the guy who wrote the original State of Play miniseries at the BBC, once said, um, "I love having written. I fucking hate writing." <laughs> <laughs> Which I think it's quite a good phrase. <laughs> oh man, like you know, it, it's I, to use a cliche. It's a love hate relationship, but it's not something I want to break up from. Um, it is. Oh God, I mean, you ask me on a different day, and and the answer would definitely be different, right? It's 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 something I don't think it's spoken out about enough. Is is the negative psych like mental challenges that can come with being a creative person? You know, it's it's so hard to switch off the ideas and sometimes I wish I could just tell myself to shut up and like enjoy some downtime but nope the ideas will always come and I have to get them down um but right like if I didn't have a creative outlet I would definitely go insane um I have to have books you know I have to be able to have the ability to write stuff and get it out there and um for me for me the biggest reward isn't it's not monetary, it's not the Kickstarter money that we make, it's not getting the publishing deal, it's not any of that stuff, it's just knowing that the book's gone into someone's hand and that they've enjoyed it, they've taken something from it, that, that is, you, you know, before we got the publisher as well, we, we absolutely ran all of our comics like a non-profit, like, we made the Kickstarter money, everything we made, we didn't keep any of it, we put it straight back into the next book, like, I didn't care about, you know, making beer tokens or, you know, making a living off of it because i have a job right i I don't need that i it's different it's different if this is your job right i I get that but you know that was it it was just the satisfaction of doing it but sometimes the road to getting to that satisfaction is genuinely upsetting and stressful and when you think about being a comic writer as well you're not just the writer you're marketing the book you're pitching it you're working out the financials you're um, doing all these other hats that I don't think writers going into their first book fully appreciate um, just because they haven't done it yet but you, you learn by doing this right this is like like yeah you have to pitch to publishers you have to pitch to the comic to press you have to work out how to build that press list um, building up a, a fan base on social like all these other skills it very quickly becomes a second job a full time job Um a lot of jobs, you know, you can switch off at the end of the day and go home. But when you're a creative person, once those ideas start popping in your head, usually, usually when you're 
your mind is quiet and you're about to go to bed, a killer new idea jumps in there. Like, you'll probably know this as well. It's it's something that I think creative people suffer from. I suppose suffers a bit melodramatic, actually, but... Um, I'll, I'll I'll take that back. It, it's it's something it's something that happens, right? You know, you, I think I think it comes to being a left brain thinker. To again use another cliche, but it's hard to turn off the ideas once they get going. You have to get them down, and if you try to ignore them, they'll gnaw away at you. And um, yeah, you know, um, I, I'm one of these people that on social media on Twitter, you know, I'm so open about venting about how I feel when it comes to writing stuff. I'll talk about my anxieties and my stress and my depression and how it's even impacting home life as well. I, I, you know, when I'm on a deadline with a comic, I'm spending less time with my wife and there's knock-on effects to these things, right? Uh, psychologically. So I think, I think comics is certainly the indie space. A lot of people, it seems, are afraid to be negative about it. Like they, they all, um, and, and I'm sure they genuinely feel this way. I, I feel this way, you know, genuinely happy and almost thankful to be a part of it to be able to have this outlet um but it's all like oh you know comics are great you know if you're not working on your comics what are you doing it's like having a rest there's no shame in you know you don't need to be on it 24 7 there's a there's this many weird mentality um and i'm not stereotyping here but i've done this for long enough that i know certainly in the american indie scene it's there's very much uh you'll sleep when you're dead mentality you should be thankful you have this chance you know this this outlet. It's like no man, like that's that's a fast track to burnout, man. That, that's the, like the hustle attitude, which I, the I hustle, just hate. Yeah, 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 I hate it. <laughs> like if you're not like if you're not always holding your craft, if you're not always doing it, then what are you doing? It's like, dude, like it, it, it's something that it isn't spoken about because I think I think if you were to come out and moan about the chance to write these comics, it almost might. I think people fear it comes across ungrateful. But it's healthy, you know. It's it's just you highlighting a very real problem. I mean, you you would not believe how many people. Again, I won't name names, of course, but so many comic creators, and that that's like writers, artists, everyone across all the disciplines that come with making comics, have spoken to me about depression. And like a lot of them have even come to me and said, "I really like how you don't give a crap about moaning about these things on Twitter because I realized once you did that that I'm not the only one that feels that way." definitely needs to be more more talking i think about the psychological impact of this um uh, you know having to learn all these things and and there's there's a big bit of anxiety that comes with not knowing the next step you know there's so many people i know are like i just want to make comics but i do not know how to get them signed i don't know where to even begin and yeah. that in itself can be it's, stressful it's, it's the weird space in a lot of creative industries where um it's what it's what uh me and my dad joke about with uh, the proper job kind of distinction, you know, where uh, where a lot of people start <laughs> in the creative industries sort of doing it as their hobby. You know, it's quite difficult to go from like, you know, school or university straight into a creative industry, especially, you know, at the level that you want to get at. It's like, if you want to be a writer writing scripts for whatever, you know, whether it be, uh, you know, books or films or TV shows or whatever, no, it's like getting going from university to I'm a writer now doesn't really happen, you know, or rarely happens. And so it's this <laughs> weird, like, kind of no man's land where it's your hobby and you're doing it in your spare time. And everyone kind of says, well, how are you going to make money on that? And they sort of look look down on it and sort of say, well, that's just your hobby or when are you going to get the, the proper job and things. And then when you have, find some success, then it's like, oh, that's your job now and that's what you do for a living. And it's kind of like there's a weird there's no in between you know but as as you say is that when you're trying to do it especially in your spare time it requires you know a lot of brain power and and effort and resources and you know you need to develop a hell of a lot of skills to you know get to the point where you can get even just get your foot in the door you know so um and i absolutely agree that you know y your brain just refuses to turn off sometimes and you have this kind of craving to just keep writing or keep working and you gotta learn you gotta learn um where you gotta take breaks um because i remember like uh my latest novel that i've started writing i sort of like rattled off the first chapter at four in the morning because i was just trying to get to bed and it just wouldn't oh. <laughs> like the, the words just came into my head and i was like well shit if i sleep i'm gonna forget all this so i gotta write it down um and then but 
at the same time, I have to force myself to take time off. Because I've, like, sort of uh, delegated every week. I'm like, right, Sunday, you don't do shit. You don't check your phone. You don't go on your computer. You go in the living room or you go outside. You know, and it's like, you do not go near work. And it's like, you literally do have to force yourself to do it sometimes. Because you're so used to, you know, kind of doing the hustle, as, as they say. And, and, like, kind of writing down ideas that you have in your head immediately. And, like, the most I allow myself to do is write down notes on my phone. It's like, if I've got an idea, don't go to your PC and start writing the script. Just write down the note on your phone to remind yourself. But, like, yeah, you have to force yourself to take time off sometimes. It's funny, isn't it, how, like, when you start off in, the, in something creative, like, I don't want to say people take a dim view of it, but there's certainly that mentality that it's a hobby. But, oh, man, like, what an involved hobby it can be, right? Like you said, all these skills try to work out the next step. Like there's so much that goes into it. So much of your life goes into it. You know, when you really, it can, it can really absorb every part of you, your time, your mental capacity, like everything um, to the point where it can actually have like physical uh, detriments, right? Like you can start to become burnt out and, you know, sitting hunched over a computer for hours, you know, four in the morning, like you say, whacking out a synopsis. It's like, it's gonna it's hell on your posture and stuff i mean these are real things they're not they're not silly complaints you know these are you know and it's the main thing that you said there is like have a day to rest have a date like 100 percent. i i do that as well I, ha I have specific days that i work on my projects every other day i ignore it but if something does come into my head i just write cliff notes i don't write anything fully formed just on my phone exactly what you said on my notes app you know, oh, oh, next time you set your computer, write this thing, you know, add this thing, you know, or here's like a bit of dialogue that I've just thought of that's just popped into my head. Um, being strict on yourself is, is definitely the key. It's definitely easier said than done, though. It's so ha so easy to regress and fall off the wagon, so to speak, and fall back into the old habits. But um, that, that that's where legitimately, like, if, if you've got really patient friends, or like, certainly my, my, my wife is so patient with me <laughs> with all this stuff, man. Like, she's very good at just saying, look, you've been sitting here for too long now. I think it's time we hung out and don't do it. You know, it's fine. You know, great. It's good that you're working, but like, I can see that you're stressing out now. So here's your little friendly reminder to stop doing that and come hang out in the real world. Yeah, no, ex um, exactly the same for me. I've got a fantastic flatmate and girlfriend who are... Uh very keenly aware of when uh, I'm in, when they say Rowan's in writing mode, where I'm just, where I'm just where they're just like, you know, don't approach him because he's trying, he's busy trying to write a thing, but then they're also keenly aware of when I've been writing for far too long, I need to get off and go somewhere. And they're also very good for when, um, you know, talked about procrastination earlier, they're very good for when I have a problem, like, figuring something out. They're very good at just sort of letting me talk at them, not even talk to them or with them, just at them. <laughs> or I'll like walk into a room in a huff and they'll be like, what's wrong? And I'm like, oh, it's this character and it's this subplot and this, it's not coming together. And they'll just rant at them for like 20 minutes and they just have to, <laughs> and they just very, very kindly sort of put up with it until, until I can sort of jog an epiphany in my mind and figure it all out. But uh, yeah, it's, it's good to kind of, and that's what's good as well as like, you know, if you're ever, you know, feeling sort of down about it or like burnt out or whatever, you know, put it all away and like go and hang out with, with, you know, a friend or a family member or something like that, because it, it'll be, it'll not only make you feel better kind of physically and mentally, but it can also help you, you know, jog, you, you know, solve the problem that's in your head that's stopping you writing the next, the next part of your manuscript or your screenplay or something like that. You know, so it's a very yeah. Do you know? Thing. Do you know? Like the 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 one the one most relatable thing there for me is um, uh, plot holes or like or like threads that don't connect, right? Or, or you know, you know where the story needs to go, right? You're currently here. Certainly in a comic, again, like if you think about the the standard comic format, is 22 pages. Again, you could do more, you could do less, but uh, for argument's sake, let's say you're like halfway through that issue, you know how the issue is going to end, but you're like, okay, God, I've only got like eight pages left. How do I get from here to there? Do I need to fix, like, you know, cut away some fat, you know, to to get back, get some pages back, or? Is this completely unworkable? Me being anxious, my first thought is this is not going to work. I will never be able to fix this. You know the doom spiral, right? Um, what I've learned now, though, and I'm, it took me a long time to become this stubborn, is just go, nope, close the laptop, stop thinking about it completely, just to empty the mind as best you can. It could take a week, but I guarantee 
the next time, you know, one night, um, a, a week from now or two weeks from now, I'll be doing something completely uh, uh, different. I'll be like, I don't know, sitting sitting watching TV or, you know, I'm about to go to bed. Again, my mind's quiet, you know, I'm about to go to bed. The solution will just pop right into my head and I'm like, of course, like, all oh, right, I've, okay. That, that happens to me every comic now. So the that hurdle always appears at some point for me. Um, I guess it's because like the stories I write are super like layered. There's so much going on in any you know in any given book, so I'm always going to run into a bit like right. How do I connect these things? Put the laptop away. Spend a few nights playing video games or watching movies with my wife, whatever. I guarantee every single time that solution will just pop into my head at some point. So now I don't even worry about it. I just do that <laughs> until it works itself out. And like as you say with um. When it comes to riffing on things and there's no original ideas, like some of the most famous, like successful and beloved movies are just like a blender full of different stuff. You know, it's like the first Matrix is like Ghost in the Shell, uh, Ninja Scroll, and like a bunch of other anime things combined with like some John Woo action films, and just they stuck it in a blender and they came up with the Matrix. And it's like, yeah, that's a great film, you know. And it's just like, and it's like <laughs> its influences are so blatant. You know, that you can literally, like, point, you know, put shots next to each other and say, look, this is where they got the idea from. And it totally works, you know? And it's like, and I I did a similar thing with, like, you know, my first book where it's like, you know, Paragon is just, like, Superman's origin story, some ancient mythology, like, Clash of the Titans stuff blended with, like, Star Wars type space opera. But then it's, like, combined with the plot structure of The Matrix crashed into Independence Day. You know, it's like it's it's very apparent where where all those ideas combined, but um, you know, so enjoying the media that that inspired you is also a way to to generate those ideas as well and solve the pro- the problems and and find where you need to go. So it's uh, this is pr- helpful. Probably not a good a good time to bring up the fact that I don't actually read that many comics anymore. <laughs> um, I I just I mean like I I do obviously you know read comics. I mean. It's, something i would highly recommend of course if you want to be a comic writer you know actually learn you know the craft and how how good stories are formed and how they're formatted and uh, get get your hands on some comic scripts just ask some other indie creators if you can see their scripts but my bit i mean the biggest thing bit of advice with that is like you can be influenced by anything like don't let anyone tell you you can't be a comic writer if you haven't read you know all the, all these like mass you know so called masterpieces of the genre like sure you know read Watchmen fine um, I I read Watchmen very late I had no interest in reading it I just not my kind of thing you know from you know and I'd seen the movie all right I I mean because it was quite a big movie at the time everyone was talking about it whether they loved or hated it everyone was talking about it um and it didn't really compel me to read the book I was like uh, at the time I wasn't really into comics right so um I came to it late and. Maybe because I maybe because I came to it late, I didn't have the same appreciation that someone might have done back in the day for it. Um, but did did it influence the way I make comics? Now I can categorically categorically say it didn't. Um, for me, that's things like the video games I mentioned earlier. You know, th- those were the th- those were my Watchmen. Those were the things that made me think. Right, I want to tell a story like this, and I'm going to tell it kind of this way. And um, so yeah, it's like. <sighs> There's a lot of like gatekeeping when it comes to any sort of pop culture, and you know, don't don't let people tell you what you need to be inspired by or like. Uh, but what I would say is though, your uh, your explanation of all the things that inspired Paragon is great. That's not something anyone should be ashamed. I'm not saying you're ashamed of that, but I, I would. It's not something anyone should be ashamed of drawing comparisons to other things, because, again, like we kickstart a lot of stuff. And on every one of my Kickstarter pages, I have a section that says, will you like this book? And I'll say, if you like these things, then yeah, you're going to love it. And then I list off movies like Akira, Ghost in the Shell, um, you know, Blade Runner. The, you know, um, and, and though those are all true. Those are things that you could probably look at my comic and say, okay, there's some inspiration here. But what that also does is it gives people something familiar to attach the comic to, right? Like, oh yeah, cool. I, I love Akira. I like Cyberpunk 2077. Okay, cool. I'm gonna I'm gonna check this comic out. Like it's there's no shame in like leaning into your influences that yeah. way, right? Um, it's also like literally how a bunch of stuff is like pitched to like executives in Hollywood and stuff where they're like, it's this movie meets this movie. You know? <laughs> exactly. Even though some of it's completely complete nonsense, but like, you know, they do that all the time of like it's thingy and meets thingy. You know, but something that's I find really interesting about inspiration is what you said about, you know, 
don't think you can't make comics if you don't read that many comics. I think that's absolutely true. And um, uh, I remember Chuck Jones, who was a, a direct, the guy who directed a bunch of very, very famous Looney Tunes uh, shorts, said that, you know, if you're a filmmaker who wants to get into filmmaking, don't just watch other movies for inspiration. Read loads of books as well. And uh, I remember, I think it was Charlie Brooker, but it could have been someone else, her, who was talking about the writing in Grand Theft Auto. And he was talking about how in GTA Vice City, he was like, right, this is a clearly written by someone who's only watched gangster movies. And then by the time he got to GTA 4, it's like, nah, this is clearly written by someone who's watched gangster movies, but they've also read a bunch of other stuff as well and, and, re- and watched a bunch of other stuff. And yeah. Yeah. one of the things when it comes to coming up with ideas with my work is I love, even though you know films is what I primarily you know, do or want to do, is I, for a lot of inspiration, I love reading comic books and graphic novels and love reading books and and watching a lot of animated stuff, generally because, like, those are mediums where the practical kind of considerations of, well, how do you shoot that, don't exist. So so to me, I sort of see those mediums or, or those genres as, like, you know, they're limitless in terms of if you can imagine it, you can draw it or you can animate it or you can describe it in a book. And I find that that's, that can be really inspiring. Whereas with movies, it's like you've got to think about, well, how are we going to do that with a green screen or with CGI or you know a puppet or what are we going to do? You know, And that can kind of stop ideas uh, in our tracks if it's too expensive or deemed too difficult kind of thing. So I find like if, if by getting inspired by mediums and genres and properties where those limits don't exist, it can kind of stimulate my brain more and come up with like more outlandish or original ideas or bigger ideas you know whereas i find if you're just kind of pigeonholed into you know i'm making movies therefore i've got to watch more movies you know it's like it may not be as helpful as you may think so i think it's very true that you know even if you don't read that many comic books don't let that stop you from making comic books you know i think that's very true yeah like i have one bit of advice though like if you are a comic writer and you admit publicly as I did on Facebook, that I hadn't read Watchmen, you are going to get hauled over oh, yeah. for days. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, 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 at that point, I, I, I mean, uh, God, like you, you cannot believe the backlash I got on Facebook. Oh, oh I think um, I can. Just, <laughs> I, I make just, Star Trek videos. Just, <laughs> you can imagine the back, <laughs> like the, the just stating an opinion in any any form, just like gets you met with like thousands of angry people. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, it was crazy. It was like, how can you how can you be a comic writer if you haven't read Watchmen? It's like I have five comics out already. Yeah, I can clearly <laughs> like, do. I, I can. I've clearly done it. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, um, I. I mean, on one hand, I do understand like people. That book at, the, at its time was quite transformative, right? It was quite different. It sort of changed the way people saw the craft. So I, I suppose, like as a, as a sort of aid, you know, into you know how to format a comic, how to how to structure the story fine it's maybe a nice bit of like background reading but like you said don't constrain yourself like the the pop culture at large you know you know mediums at large are so rich with all these different bits of inspiration limiting yourself is just a bad idea like it's yeah just just because you never know like what what crazy thing you watch or you see uh you know you play will inspire your next big idea like why would you constrain yourself like that you know, you're you're spot on. You know, but the 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 Chuck Jones one's interesting. Actually, it's kind of, but it just proves the point, right? I mean, all, all medium is all mediums are valid. You mm. know? It it also helps kind of uh, by kind of embracing more mediums as well. It also kind of helps you edu- educate yourself about the genre as well, because um, like several of the videos I've made are about um, you know people on the internet who are very quick to accuse so and so of ripping off another thing. And then you sort of like, if you apply your standard of what a ripoff is to all of these properties, you basically would have <laughs> nothing to watch, you know. <laughs> you know, and uh, so I think you know if you embrace other mediums where it's like, don't just if you want to write science fiction or make science fiction, don't just watch sci-fi TV shows and don't just watch sci-fi movies. Read a bunch of sci-fi as well, and you know, play a lot of sci-fi video games or find a friend who plays them or watch a Let's Play online or something like that. You know, but like. Um, if you can kind of embrace all the mediums in that genre, then it's kind of like, then there are more places to inspire you and there are more um, stories to, to discover and get invested in, which I think is really cool. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely. yeah. 
So uh, we've been talking for a little bit uh, <laughs> now, but uh, <laughs> it's been great. But uh, if you have any, what do you have any parting advice before we wrap wrap things up? Yeah, I'll give you like so. I, I actually use this one quite a lot, right? Uh, um, but it, it's there's a reason I keep going back to it, right? So I remember the very first time someone came up to me at a comic con. Like there's a there's a kid, you know, came up to me with his parents, and they were like, "Oh, he, he's he was really shy, you know. He came up, you know, to the table and stuff." And his parents were like, "Oh, yeah, he really wants to be a comic writer, um, but he, he doesn't know how to start. He doesn't know how to how to write." And I. I um, essentially said, um, well, um, just, just write, like, not in an unhelpful way, you know, I, I didn't just say just write, um, I elaborated on it, I just said, like, just write, because that that's how you get better, right, that's how you start to learn the craft, it's, like, writing is very much a learn by doing, like, there's writing, you know, there's, there's English theory and stuff, right, there's theory to writing, but you're only going to get better at it and gain confidence as a writer and find your own voice over time if you just do it. Um, it's the exact same principle as being an artist, right? You know, you start off when you're a kid, you're doing doodles uh, and then, you, you know, you see like posts on social now, quite a lot of them where it's like my first ever sketch and here's like where I am now and the, the difference is crazy but that took so much effort and iteration and, and growth and um, the way to do it is just write. I mean, and that that's like something I tell everyone J- just do it like then the quite often the response I get to that is yeah but I'm not very good and and the first draft I write is going to be terrible and I'm like yeah it will be like that's one thing you need to understand is your first draft is a first draft for a reason right it's just the the, the main the main goal the first goal for any writer who's trying to create a new comic the biggest goal you need to set your sights on once you start writing the script get it finished don't 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 over worry about oh this is rubbish like this is not my best work because it won't be your best work right it's the hard truth is that your first draft will not be good it might be okay it might be okay but it's not representative of what the final product will be um and just like telling your inner voice to shut up and just let you write the damn thing um is such a big challenge get that first draft done don't be afraid to even just show it around to some friends and say hey how would you improve this um, and if a friend comes back and tells you it's all good, they're lying. <laughs> they're just trying to spare your feelings. You don't want a friend to do that. You want a friend who's maybe not horrible, but they won't hold back. They're going to give you constructive feedback. Um, then from draft one, you do draft two, then three. I mean, I've done draft iterations up to like draft 20 plus um, because I'm a stupid obsessive who never lets things go. Um, but, you know, like, it will improve over time. You just have to believe in yourself enough to get that first draft done. Then everything else will follow. Um, then you can start figuring out all, <laughs> all the other things that come with being a comic writer, like the business and Kickstarters. Like, don't worry about that. Just get your story yeah. done. Um, I think they sort of, um, like, there are no writing prodigies. No one was born just being able to craft a masterpiece. You know, it's like everyone totally. wrote shit at first and then they got better. <laughs> you know, uh, I think Robert Rodriguez said like every every wannabe filmmaker has 10 bad movies in them at least. So the sooner you get those out of the way, the better, you know, the, the, the sooner you get to the good stuff. But I think it's always good advice. But it's all development building, right? It's all like you learn from those mistakes, you pick up some little things that maybe you didn't, you know that you can improve upon and j- just view that view those early years or however long it takes those early experiences just view them as like yeah learning constructive it's just part of your growth right i mean i, I look back at my first scripts and i see things that i i would definitely not do now but then i, s- I still see things that i like and i'm like do you know what i was a different different person back then right i didn't have the skills i did now and, and it's yeah, it's all relative, you know. You all, it's all in service of you of you honing your craft. So, yeah, get that first draft done. Just against all odds, just finish it. And then you can worry about improving it later. Exactly. I agree. Okay, um, I think we'll wrap it up there. So, uh, thank you so much for joining me today, Dave. Um, for all those interested, you can get Killtopia and, you know, all, all the other comic books and things uh, that, that Dave has written. I'll put links everywhere so you can uh, grab stuff. Um, I'd highly recommend it. Um, until next time, thank you for listening. I hope we, we imparted some kind of useful advice uh, and missed all our ramblings. But uh, So thank you for listening, thank you for watching, and uh, until next time, have a good one, live long and prosper. <laughs>